We see you well, and the live stream has begun. Just getting my notes. All right, folks on Zoom, folks in the space, bonjour et bienvenue tout le monde. On behalf of all of us here at Force Space, welcome in person or via Zoom to The Spark, Courageous Explorations in Materiality and Sustainable Design, presented by students in Design for Theater, Sustainable Practices, um, students who took this course this semester with their prof, Anna Capilouto. So before passing it over to Anna, whose students you'll be hearing from today, just a quick note that we are coming to you live from Concordia University Sports Space, located on unceded indigenous lands in Jojage, Montreal. At Fourth Space, we work to connect people to the initiatives, research pro projects, classroom activities, and dialogues happening across the university via daily events. So welcome all. We are super excited to have this space filled with your energy, your amazing projects. We can't wait for this walkthrough. And those of you joining us via Zoom, feel free to jump in with uh, comments and questions throughout as well. And turn on your camera if you're happy to do so. We are also live streaming this event to YouTube, and I'll pop that link in the chat in a minute. All right, that's it for me and the housekeeping. Over to you, Anna. Welcome. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, Anna, Anna. Um, first of all, congratulations, students. And I know some of you are graduating this time. Well done. I hope you've gone to some amazing work. Um, I think I'm just going to speak for a couple of moments on how I got here. Um, so uh, you all know that I was out of the department for a long time, and I came back energized a couple of years ago, teaching full time. Um, and I wanted to try exploring new special topics for, for the de department and for the design area specifically. Um, so I think two Octobers ago, I proposed a new course in sustainable practices, and uh, it was accepted by the department. Um, I dabbled in it a little bit on my own, my own practice as a set designer, but um, really hadn't done that much work uh, around it, not sustained work. <laughs> No, no pun intended. Um, so uh, as I was getting ready for the course, um, I realized that I'd made a, a, a bit of a mistake. I made it a, a 498 um, course, which is usually for senior students. Uh, I realized that probably it should have been a first year class. Um, so what ended up happening was that I was inviting uh, all programs and all years to register. So the work you'll see today is, oh, we have designers, of course, in here. We have performance creation students, and we have communication student. Am I missing anybody? No, I think that's the cohort. We have first, second, and third year students in here. Um, we spent the semester really just exploring. Um, we uh, we've had many many visitors uh, because of Zoom. It's been possible to invite people uh, from the states. Uh, we had field trips to Eco Say No and a, a paper making mill. Uh, it was really just 13 weeks of exploration. Um, I told them not to worry about their final uh, outcome, the spark. Um, it really was the process that we were looking after. So, um, and they're amazing, by the way. Thank, if you look after the process, the product looks after itself, right? Um, so we have a, a sort of stations of students all around uh, the fourth space. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I have a TA, Emily Tucker, where is she? Oh, sorry, darling, um, who is gonna talk more about her journey, um, and uh, I'll pass it to you, my love. Thanks, Anna. Um, 
So Anna and I agreed over the summer, um, I was very inspired, first of all, with uh, Anna's uh, initiative within the theater department. So uh, we endeavored to receive the um, Concordia Undergraduate Student Research Award in Sustainable Design and do a case study on the theater department and um, how sustainable we are compared to international models of sustainable theater making. Uh, and so after that summer, we worked really hard on this course, <laughs> and Anna um, uh, has done a really amazing job at uh, creating the uh, syllabus to bring us through the, the concept of greenwashing all the way to what we are presenting today, which is the spark. So what you're going to see um, is design that is inspired by sustainability from the initial uh, spark that a designer needs to have of inspiration for a project, any project, any artist, any maker, any creator. Um, so we're really proud of the students. And uh, we're going to start by taking you around on a little tour of each of the stations. Yeah? All right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get started, I can elaborate a little further on um, the case study of the department. I went around to all of the shop heads, all of the departments um, within theater that work on our productions, um, as well as uh, the Digi Lab and all, all different facets of Concordia. Um, and what I was really doing was I was asking a lot of questions. There was a series of interviews throughout the entire summer about our practice and how we can improve but also what are we doing already and what are the limitations to those things so for example in the scene shop um, what is the challenge behind repurposing wood that we use to construct the set so how much are we getting rid of how much are we trashing why are we doing it and what is the barrier there to um, improve sustainability efforts so at times that was um, time constraints right it was it was hands on deck especially during covid um, staff, faculty, but also um, budget, right? We always run into this. So as designers, uh, one of the things that we need to focus on the most is being creative with sustainability in mind from the beginning, because these challenges will always be there. <laughs> so um, with that case study, Anna has been able to move forward with a lot of different proposals for the department, which is fantastic. Um, and this class being the first initiative um, towards sustainable design and teaching and evolving and growing together. Um, it's been really fantastic to witness the process. Yeah. And the database. Yes, yeah, so we will be, thank you, Anna. We will be um, creating a database. We already are in process of it from this class towards uh, tracking our research into materiality, into our individual uh, projects in terms of the amount of time and the amount of challenge. So. I will ask the students about this individually when I come around, but it'd be great to hear some of that research that you've all done that I know because I've seen it and we've talked about it um, into what did you what did you discover right throughout this process? What did you discover uh, about the textile industry or what did you discover about uh, the the material that you're using? Um, a lot of this focused on the materiality as one element of sustainable design that we know is not is not the only element and is not the most important element so we will um, be moving forward with all of those different elements that need to be addressed uh, but this this specifically uh, was really about getting the students to appreciate and enjoy the, pr the process of diving into new materiality and considering sustainability from multiple angles um, so they've all done that and they've learned so much and I'm really excited to present these projects. They just have blown us away. So I'll get started on that. And let's start with Lindsay. Over the five minutes? Okay, so we'll take five before we start. And uh, we will take a short break. We'll be back to you in five. Okay. 
All right, so we're back. Very fast five minutes we have. <laughs> Hi. So where's the camera going to see us? Let's make sure that we're visible to this camera. There's going to be an iPad walking around. So yeah, great. OK, so hi, Lindsay. How are you? OK, I'm going to hand you the mic and ask you to um, tell us a little bit about this beautiful design. Um, is, this, is this how close you hold the mic? I don't know. I'm not like used to. OK, so this is 22nd Century Life. It's sort of a commentary or thinking about the sort of life that can live in the wake of the destruction we're doing to the planet. and how we're leaving plastic, we're leaving toxic waste, and the things that will thrive in that are not necessarily the things that cohabit with like humans the best. And yeah. Um, so beautiful piece. I wanted to ask you about your research and your process um, and what brought you to these materials. Um, yeah, I'd love to. So this is, I mean, not fully anatomically correct, but very much based on a cockroach. And I did like measured all the different body parts and tried to re replicate it. And the idea was to mix organic and inorganic components, plastics, like some food that is dehydrated, um, pieces of paper. I have a, a branch here as part of the whole thing, um, pieces of metal. The idea was to have it be very heterogeneous because it's like it is the process of creation that is happening in the world. Fantastic. I'm just going to read this for people, for folks at home. Um, so the title is 22nd Century Life. With the increasing presence of byproducts of human consumption in all parts of the world, from our forests to our oceans to space to within our blood and lungs, life will adapt as life does. But that which can live amongst human garbage may not be to our liking. Now is the time for monsters. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. All right. We'll move along. Hi, Zach. And I'll take the other microphone for Zach. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, good thing Zach is great with technology. <laughs> Give it a test. Is it on? Hello, hello. There we go. Awesome. OK. Um, hi, Zach. Tell us hi. about your project a little bit. Yeah. Um, basically, I did a lot of research to try and see how uh, would it be possible to turn 3D printing, so additive manufacturing, into a zero waste uh, fabrication method for theater uh, instead of using different types of resin, which can be really, really toxic, um, using, uh, well, this is the most eco-friendly pos uh, possible plastic that there is on the market today, which is uh, PLA, polylactic acid, which is corn-based. Uh, but unfortunately, since it's so um, refined and uh, polymerized, it is very hard to uh, biodegrade without uh, huge composting facilities, and even then, it's not perfect. So. 3D printing in itself is great because it doesn't generate a lot of waste, but the kind of waste it could create is support material for more complex models, failed prints, and also small leftover filament from uh, the spools, which can be really hard to use uh, when you print on a larger scale. Um, so to try and use everything uh, that is generated by 3D printing, I basically sculpted using a heat gun all that kind of leftover material uh, to create a very organic creature uh, in this instance. But I also tried making it into sheets, uh, but I didn't have the time, unfortunately, to experiment further into making sheets that could be useful in a prop shop or a scene shop in various applications. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and do you want to tell us a little bit about um, your background and why this project? Sure. Was well, I focus a lot on prop and costume making using 3D printing as my main source of manufacturing. Uh, and it's been, I've been using 3D printing since 2014 about. So I have a fair amount of experience uh, with it. Uh, and I think it's a fantastic tool for makers in general. So yeah. Great. Um, great. I'm going to read this for the folks at home again. So turning 3D printing into a zero waste manufacturing. 
3D printing is a key tool in my work as a prop and costume builder, and more often than not, support material is required. Even if I already use a bioplastic, it takes very specific conditions to biodegrade. For this reason, I've upcycled the waste byproduct into a sculpting medium. Wonderful, Zach. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we'll continue along. Over to the window. Hi, Louise. Hey. <laughs> All right, let's get set up here with the iPad. Hi, Louise. Hi. Um, okay, so to so my understanding, there's, there's three pieces to introduce, correct? Absolutely, Okay, yes. awesome. Would you like to tell us about them? Yes, of course. Um, so first off, we have, I've always been interested with new materials and especially organic materials that grow on us continuously. And human hair has always been a source of like very a much more curiosity. Uh, so basically what I did is I made, I, I kind of wanted to do like a hat out of human hair because uh, I found it funny, which is <laughs> what I do most of the time for my projects. If I find it funny, I do it. Uh, so the first project I have is a hat made of human hair. Um, the second project that I have is an underwear set, also oh. made of human hair. Mm -hmm. And the last project that I have is kind of all the plastic waste that I have accumulated um, since the beginning of the year. I have collected and I have put it into uh, a dress that I made as well. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Let's get a closer look at the hair <laughs> underwear. Um, and your background is in costume design. Yes, yes? Okay. it is. Fantastic. What uh, do you want to describe some of the research and the process uh, that you had to go through in order to um, construct with hair? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what I did first was I researched a lot into wig making um, and how to make wigs, how to kind of play with hair. Um, I have a background in costume making and cosplay, so it was a bit in my cords to just play with new materials and create things out of weird uh, materials. Uh, so how to do it? I basically kind of went to get a haircut myself uh, to the hairdresser and just kind of collected the hair waste uh, that was in the salon at the time and also collected uh, human hair wigs that a friend of mine decided to give me. Um, yeah. Great, and, and constructing, so, and so um, I guess follow-up question, the uh, actual connection of the hair into, with the sculpting. Oh, um, yeah. so basically this is a base out of uh, old paper from my sketchbooks, um, and the hair is sculpted with um, glue. It is a uh, hot glue that I had at home that uh, I just placed in the way and intertwined it to kind of make it stay. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Louise. No worries. All right. I guess, Carolee, let's get the other microphone. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Hi. All right. Beautiful. OK, so we've got the dress, and I will get out of the shot. <laughs> Hi, Carolee. You want to introduce your project a little bit? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to explore various materials and how to use it and draping as well. So I created the bodice out of the bin of our existence, face masks. Uh, so all of the top is face masks. Turns out uh, I used 20 for just the top, so I couldn't do the whole dress in it, of course, because I wouldn't go and pick up face masks on the street. So I used uh, reused uh, bed sheets. So basically, the whole thing is upcycling. Mm -hmm. uh, I used bed sheets that I had at home that I'm not using anymore. And the back is, if you want to go around, is all quilted from uh, scrap fabrics that I had at home as well. So the idea was really uh, exploring various materials, creating a full dress out of whatever I had uh, at home. Uh, in a sense, and I also wanted to explore sequins. Uh, so uh, my dearest partner uh, punch hold uh, plastic bottles <laughs> for a long time, um, and we created sequins for uh, the front of the bodice, and I hand sewed them uh, as much as I could uh, with the time. Um, so in the front, there's uh, two colored sequins out of plastic bottles. So yeah. 
Fantastic, beautiful. Um, and what did you discover about the, the time and the process um, as far as it relates to sustainability and materiality? I know well, that that was something. Yeah, uh, so, well, especially the techniques I use, draping and quilting, <laughs> takes already a lot of time. So, uh, well, especially with sustainability, wanting to reuse all those little bits of scraps uh, that you had at home, uh, of course, it's going to take time. Uh, so you have to prepare for that, or maybe like just do sheets of scrap materials and then cut your pattern into it and then uh, work it out. So yeah, it's always that that struggle of time. And well, I wanted to explore draping as well, so that took a bit more time, but it was fun. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks. And I just realized I'm I'm gonna come back around later to read that card because I didn't do it. I'm so sorry, Louise. But I'm gonna read this for the folks at home again. Um, material galore. This dress was made out of a variety of upcycled elements, face masks, all the ones I had to wear at Concordia, bed sheet and leftover fabric, and sequins made out of plastic bottles. No material was bought, especially for this project. Uh, it demonstrates in various techniques one of the facets of sustainability in theater. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And a short walk over to Melody. Hi, Melody. You want to tell us about Hi. this beautiful project? Uh, yeah. So uh, a little bit like my colleague right over there, um, I reused some materials that I had at home. Um, didn't really know what I was doing, actually. Um, I just. I wanted to do a dress, didn't know uh, <laughs> how it would be, but I just started using all different materials and I came up with that. And to also have kind of a statement about like fast fashion and um, that, yeah, we go in store, we buy stuff, but we don't really know where, you know, where they come from. And, uh, you know, just to think about it and maybe recycle and reuse uh, clothing, yeah. Fantastic, where did you um, source all of the fabric? Um, a lot of it is from Concordia, actually, <laughs> it's from like <laughs> uh, material that uh, we uh, that we recycled from the productions um, and also from my uh, one of my uh, old costumes that I did that I reuse the material out of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. This is a good opportunity to plug the scraps bin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, advertisement for the costume shop scraps bin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. And what's the title of the piece? Um, it's fast fashion. That's what. It, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And as we walk around, um, anybody feel free to, um, as soon as we're concluding the presentation, to speak with the students, ask questions, and look more closely at all of the projects. All right. Hi, Madison. Hello. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. You want to introduce this beautiful light fixture? <laughs> yeah. So uh, this piece was inspired by the amount of plastic that is normally accumulated in my household. Um, we go through a lot of plastic containers, whether that be fruit containers, tofu containers, shampoo bottles, anything like that. Um, so I wanted to find a creative way to be able to reuse that plastic. Um, so the first thing that came to mind was being able to melt it down and remold it and reuse it in a way, in some sort of fun way. Um, but the issue that I came across with this is that it does release a lot of toxins and that a lot of our plastics that we accumulate actually aren't very reusable. There's only certain numbers that are actually healthy that we can reuse. Um, so it was a matter of researching those proper plastics, being able to properly ventilate and go through the process of melting down this plastic. Um, so what I was able to do was um, combine different kinds of plastics. Um, so that would be the two and five plastics that you see in your recycling. Um, melt that down um, and then reuse an old lamp that was no longer being used um, at my partner's place. Um, and then rewiring it and sewing everything all together onto this unused lamp. Um, and so, yeah, here it is. <laughs> no materials were bought in this. It's all um, completely reused materials and sustainable. Yeah. Fantastic. What was the greatest challenge in, uh, in the process? Because I, I know that this was 
Yes, the Thank biggest you. challenge was the fragility. Um, a lot of the pieces come apart, if not melted together very well. So um, when attaching it, a, what I found happening was that a lot of the pieces were kind of crumbling in my hands. And so it took a lot of time to remelt that plastic together and then reattach it. Um, so that was probably the hardest point. Yeah, fantastic. I'll read this. Recycled pendant lamp. This project was inspired by the amount of plastic waste that is accumulated on a day-to-day -day basis and the urge to transform it into something beautiful and practical. The lampshade made from reused and melted plastic waste creates a unique twist for this old lamp that went otherwise untouched. Beautiful. Thank you, Madison. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, we'll go to Geo next. You sure? Mixing it up. <laughs> Hi. Let me grab that other microphone. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Hi. <laughs> oh yeah, because you need to. Okay, so I'll. Do you want me? Why don't you introduce it and then I'll, and then I'll um, step back so you can um, manipulate it. Hi. This is Gary. <laughs> um, has become sort of a class joke, but I started with this boy from the prop shop uh, for our, our first project where we did research on something that we had created in the past and I didn't have something so I went to the prop shop and found this boy that I promptly named Gary and everyone took a fonding to that uh, fond liking to that name um, and the idea for my project was to create uh, a new Gary made of sustainable material and I got stuck on trying to completely greenwash him and for the most part, I accomplished that in this project, but there were some uh, unexpected consequences to trying to be completely sustainable that you'll see as I manipulate him. Great, let's watch. I burnt the side of his face. <laughs> oh, but Gary. It kind of matches the creepiness of the original a little bit. So I figured it, it, it works a little bit. And can you tell um, us about the materials that are, that are in this? Yeah, so uh, for everything is um, sustainable, for us, I think. Um, the, the, <laughs> the fabric is 100% cotton. Um, I found sheets of it at a uh, renaissance, a flippity. Um, and I used uh, um, a T-shirt that I found at the CUCCR uh, for the neck. And the inside, it's stuffed with feathers from a pillow that we, we found. Um, and the, the coolest part that I actually really enjoyed messing around with was the salt dough recipe that I found as a replacement for um, the FIMO or the FIMO that they used in the original Gary. Um, it, it worked really well for the feet. Uh, and the head came out all right. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's moldable and uh, you bake it in the oven and then it hardens really, really well. And I was, I was surprised at how, uh, how durable it was because those things aren't going anywhere. I've never heard of salt dough before. Can you tell me really quickly what's in it? Yeah, it's just flour, salt, and some water pretty much. And then you, you mix it all together and it, you get a consistency of like a, like a molding uh, sculpture it's what is it called sculpting clay yeah, yeah. Mod like modeling clay yeah. similar yeah. wonderful and what um program are you in we haven't been announcing our program i am in performance creation performance creation yeah first year awesome thank you so much dio <laughs> wonderful work <laughs> all right olivia let's go over to the light box do you want to introduce your project so um, my project was inspired by stained glass. Um, currently in the world, there's a bit of a, Micro a, a glass bit. shortage. So I was trying to find a way to replicate the look of stained glass without actual glass. Um, I chose to do something that was biodegradable. So this is um, entirely sugar. So when you hang it in the sun, as you would hang a, a sun catcher, it will melt which is, um, in my opinion, a good commentary on beauty and 
um, just nature, like in general. So as you can see, there's been some issues. Um, the glass is very, very fragile, so it broke, but I fixed it as best as I could. But I think it's it's part of the process and the end goal for the end goal for the piece is for it to self destruct and to be returned to the earth. So I feel like it breaking is part of the process. Um, so yeah, this is the final piece. I also brought one of my prototypes um, because I thought it added to the whole look. So yeah, this is this is the work. Absolutely, thanks. Um, and given that, is there anything that going forward you would want to adapt? Like, like what was the most challenging part of of, of the composition? Um, I think the biggest challenge was definitely um, the fact that this is just candy making. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of research in temperatures, conditions, humidity, ingredients. So it was, yeah, it was just like cooking <laughs> at this point. So. I think doing more research would make even better results. Great, and if anybody gets a chance, you should really see the, the small one close up. Um, I'll go ahead and read this. Biodegradable stained glass. With this project, I set out to create a piece of work inspired by stained glass windows that was biodegradable. By using sugar to create the appearance of glass, this piece comments on the ephemerality of art and beauty. When placed in the sun, this piece will inevitably melt and disintegrate, returning itself to the earth. Thank you so much, Olivia. Beautiful. Great. Thank you. We'll move to Violette. Hi. Uh, another stained glass project. Um, I wanted to create a cape that was made just of recycled material. So my really kind neighbor had this really cool plastic from um, a mattress that he bought. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna use that because there's so many things that we just like just throw away that could be used in so be many beautiful ways. Um, I really like the transparency of it. So everything that has been used in this cape has been from stuff that I uh, had at home or that was given to me. Uh, the fabric, the black fabric is from the CUCCR bins in Concordia, that is really helpful. Um, yeah, I wanted to create this uh, peacock cape because peacock has a lot of, is usually uh, linked to like narcissism and um, yeah, beauty in a way, but also has those beautiful meaning of longevity and wisdom. And I thought it was something that was a beautiful link to sustainability as well. And also peacocks are beautiful. So I think it's really cool with the stained glass <laughs> effect. So yeah, this cape was really long to make, really dainty, but I, I really loved it. And yeah, that's what I have to say with it. Fantastic. <laughs> Can you talk about um, applying the color a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the colors, all the colors in this, there's two different techniques. So um, the green uh, part of the peacock cape has been made with, and also the, the um, the branches has been made with um, food coloring. So I didn't use uh, any paint for that. Um, so food coloring and a little mix of Mod Podge because I had so many Mod Podge at home from other projects that I never used. So I needed to use it as well. And also for uh, the blue and the flowers, um, I also had so many uh, like paint, like papier de soie, how do you say that in English? Tissue, tissue paper. paper, thank yeah. you. So many tissue paper that it was just being left in a box and never used. So that's how I made the colors. I also had to taint some tissue papers to have the colors that I wanted. So the blue loop around it is actually food coloring and tissue paper. So it was a lot of like trying and like painting my paper, waiting for it to dry, <laughs> putting in all the, the plastic. But like that, I was able to create the colors that I really wanted and that could look good on the cape. Great, thanks. And your stream of study is? Uh, design, <laughs> I wanna go in costumes. Fantastic, so, yeah. I'll read your, uh, le oh, yeah. you should read that title better okay. because I'm going to butcher <laughs> the French and it will embarrass me. Okay, Le Pont Insomniac. <sighs> 
Okay. Even shaming scares him. <laughs> a stained glass effect cape made completely with reused materials. For this project, I only used things I had at home, like food coloring, fabric found at the CUCCR. The plastic was an old mattress protection. Peacocks represent longevity and wisdom. I hope to bring those notions more in my path to sustainability. Thank, Thank you, Violette. You. Yep, we can go to Jess. Sorry. <laughs> Stand by. Hi, Jess. Hi. Uh, so my name is Jess Bove. I'm a Mohawk of Kahnawake, and I'm a second year performance creation student. Um, so I started out this year um, playing a lot with plastic, specifically plastic bags. Um, I started working with it in a term like in way of like a textile. I was spinning it. I was braiding it. Um, I was making sheets. Um, and later on, I moved on to other textiles like material like cotton. Um, and in the end, I wanted to stick with plastic because there is much to say about um, our use and consumption of plastic. Um, so my project is called We Are What We Eat. It is a meal of basically food products that are like highly impacted by micro and nanoplastics. So of course, we, we have uh, starting out with the lobster, we know that there are micro and nanoplastics in the ocean. Um, and I did some research of looking for different, um, just looking for, like what they see in research in terms of like what products have a lot of microplastics for whatever reason. And I, we've seen a lot like wheat. So I have my beer right here. We, um, so from, so from um, production, processing and packaging, a lot of um, plastics make their way in on top of already the plastics that exist in the land and in the oceans. Um, so I have my wheat beer, my, you know, my beer, obviously made of wheat hops, <laughs> and I have my plastic water bottle filled with, you know, water. Um, again, I have my lobster, um, which we know, again, like uh, oceans tend to have a lot of micro and nanoplastics. I also have um, some lettuce, and also, again, lettuce was seen to have lots of um, nanoplastics due, due to the absorption of water. Same thing with fruits, and so you ha I have my tomato. Um, a lot of root vegetables also. So potatoes, onions, I have my onions on top of my lettuce. And I thought I just added a corn in here that I have uh, actually from an inspiration from an artist I found on TikTok named Scarlett Elizabeth. Um, they made a basically a corn out of plastic bag in a similar fashion to the way I was experimenting all semester. And so I took that, I, I talked to them, asked them about their process and decided to um, add a corn in there um, because being Mohawk, um, we have connection to the, the land and food sources such as corn and I wanted to just add that in there um, because again I am an indigenous artist and we tend to use what we have in abundance in terms of um, materials and knowledge. Fantastic and I just um, I see this and I know you're a process can I ask you quickly about this? Yes um, so this is like one of like the first things I made when I was uh, <laughs> uh, experimenting with textiles in terms of um, spinning and braiding plastic bags. So I just made a little bag with some scraps so I wouldn't have to, um, you know, just have scraps. I wanted to use as much of the material as possible. Um, so yeah, and one last thing is um, for my project, I wanted to challenge myself um, with finding plastics and materials where I didn't have to dye, I didn't have to color it. I spend a lot of time looking and searching for materials where they were very similar shades or, you know, colors of those foods. Great. Thank you so much, Jess. I'll read your title. We are what we eat. Microplastics are beyond just the ocean. From the tallest peaks to the depths of the sea, we have found single-use plastics littered. As an Indigenous artist, I use the materials and knowledge that are available to me. Enjoy a meal from earth to table with help and inspiration by Scarlett Elizabeth and Morgan Curat. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. you. We'll move to Carol, yeah? Great. Hi, Carol. <laughs> your design or your stream of study here? I am in the design uh, for the theater program. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. You want to introduce your project? Uh, yeah. So I had a bunch of ideas for this. First, um, identity. Um, so I started with the phrase, blood is thicker than water, and the fact that we can interpret it in two ways. First, um, blood is thicker than water, so family more important than no, friends more important than family. Um, <laughs> or no, friend, family more important than friends. 
Mm. Um, or the actual uh, quote, which is, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb, which means um, that the relations that we make are stronger than the bonds that we have with our family. Can be. Mm. Um, and so I had this idea of creating a tree that bleeds water mm. to have this sense of ambiguity where, for example, for myself, um, I'm not sure what kind of relationship I have with my identity, my culture, et cetera. Um, there's also um, uh, an aspect of fabric. I really love fabric, but I have this like um, clash where I know when I'm done with it, it's going to go to probably landfills. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've been hoarding and uh, keeping old projects, failed projects, scraps, uh, in order to re, uh, repurpose them someday. And so I thought of finding a way to, to reuse those scraps in, in a new way. So what I did, I um, explored the felting te technique where you take a needle and you punch through uh, felt and fabric to fuse them together to make my tree. Fantastic. Thank you. And what about the research? Can you speak a little bit about, because I know you've done a lot of research into material, um, into different fabrics and connecting them and the, the punching. So can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, the best fabrics to use for <laughs> felting is felt and wool. <laughs> and most of my fabrics were cotton or polyester, so it wouldn't work. So I had to really undo the fabrics and expose the threads and with that, I could uh, punch. We can see a bit uh, behind. We could, uh, the threads go behind and it all gets connected together. Great, and please feel free to examine this closer as you make your way through the space. Thank you, Kara. I'll um, read your title, Revisit. Blood is thicker than water, but my tree bleeds watery sap. Repurposed scraps, re-dyed with natural pigments, fused together by the puncture of a felting needle. Present my feelings on this subject to the idea of care, and a will to do better. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Patrick and then we'll go to um, Izzy after that. All right. Hi, Hi Patrick. Everyone. Hi. <laughs> My name is Pat. Oh. <laughs> My name is Patrick Dale. I am a fourth year performance creation student, and fun fact. This is my last class of my undergrad. Congratulations. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So this is my piece. Doesn't look like much now, but just wait. <laughs> so why don't I put it on? <laughs> so this is a uh, feather boa made out of plastic bags. I was really inspired by drag queens, actually, and how, um, unfortunately, drag now is kind of very unsustainable, and queens are expected to be in a new outfit every single time you see them. That's bullshit. We <laughs> hate that. <laughs> um, and so I decided I wanted to make a feather boa for the new millennium, I guess. Um, so all of these bags, most of them are brought from the Concordia University Center of the Creative Reuse. Mm -hmm. I said that a little wrong, but it's fine. <laughs> CCUCR said that wrong too. CUCCR. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, and the base back. is actually a cord for a computer. I don't know what kind of cord, but a cord. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, folks on Zoom, so sorry you can't try it on, but I recommend everyone here come by, take a look on it, take a look in the mirror, it's gorgeous. Um, do you want me to read this or? Yeah, um, you can read that, and then I also just want to ask you about the research that you did earlier in the semester with plastic as well. The sequins. Oh, yes! Um, earlier in this class, I made uh, sequins out of plastic, and I made sequins out of a KD box. Um, basically, it was the same same concept. Um, I wanted to explore my desire for glamour in a dying world. So <laughs> that explains the boa, that explains the sequins, that explains the gorgeousness. So this piece, Plastic Boa, is um, the inspiration behind this piece came from my desire for glamour in a dying world. I want to show that sustainability does not have to sacrifice gorgeousness. Yes. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Or Izzy. I'm sorry. I said Izzy next. Yeah. We'll come right back to you after. 
This is, yeah, in, in, inside the cinema space. So we'll get the camera in here. And if people can gather around the sides, please, that would be great. Take your time. I'll just sit, you know. Yeah, I mean, I and there's like some space down here so people can sit gather around, if they gather would around. like. Yeah, yep. come and squeeze. Explore this. We're all friends. Yes, squeeze yeah. and distance. Um, it, it's possible. <laughs> Anything's possible. Um, hi. So, hi, my name is Izzy. I'm a first year performance creation student. And a couple of weeks ago, I started exploring uh, sustainable dyes and paper. And during my exploration, I discovered that the life cycle of these materials are so different than your everyday paint and paper. And I became really interested in documenting that life cycle. So I made um, a film and I'm gonna show it to you right now. <laughs> Please enjoy. So the film loops back, but I'm just going to turn this down because I know we don't have a ton of time. Yeah. And what were we watching there growing? I want I, if you can speak to that for a second. So um, the materials used, it's all uh, paper that I made and sustainable dyes that I cooked myself. <laughs> um, so a lot of the colors are made from paprika, um, pomegranate, kale, uh, turmeric, and I just watered them all down. I have a recipe if people want. <laughs> and then the rest of it is um, moss that I collected. Great, thanks. And we'll be using those, we'll be adding that to the database so that we will yes. be able to continue that knowledge through the, throughout the department. Um, so thank you. Do you want to read this or do you, would you like me to? <laughs> um, I can totally read Great. it. It's, so the film title is Decomposition and combining my fascination with living artwork and sustainability and the longevity of a piece of work depending on the material used resulted in an exploration of the life cycle of natural dyes and paper as they morph in a fascinating narrative of their own thank you so much izzy no problem all right over to the window all right hi madeline hello Hello, Zoom. Hello, YouTube. Um, yeah, I think I think the camera is taking a little time, so I yes, can just we'll, we'll let the camera come around. We'll, we'll just hang out until then. Hello. I want to introduce the, um, the department that you're in as well, the, yes, your uh, program. My name is Madeleine Savoie. I am a first year performance creation student. And uh, yes, uh, during the conceptualization of this piece, I was sort of torn. I heard many of my classmates uh, discussing all sorts of really compelling ideas. Some of them were going in a direction of sort of repurposing materials that were non-organic and could not be returned to the earth and trying to find a second life for them, while others were building something from the earth and trying to make something that could have a short lifespan and then return. And as I was sort of deciding which direction I wanted to go in, I realized I didn't really want to choose. And that sort of led me to this double sided mask that I've created. And um, yeah, it was an interesting process building it. The, we have one half, uh, which is, uh, has a growth of chia seeds on it, of chia sprouts. And then the other half, which is a uh, sort of skull that is made out of all plastics from waste in from my own room and uh it's been uh it's been a very interesting process yeah great thanks the organic and the inorganic combined um and anything about this process of discovery with the with the material oh very much um and i suppose it links back to the theme of it all but trying to 
hold on to when it looks its best and when it looks its most beautiful became an increasingly difficult thing to do. And ultimately I had to let that go because uh, when I first made the base of this mask, uh, it is just cheese organic cheesecloth, uh, cotton and starch. And it was perfectly molded to my face. It was a very clearly defined shape. And then as layers were added onto it, as growth came through, it became less and less defined. And a very similar thing happened with the, with the left side of it here with the chia seeds. Uh, merely three or four days ago, they were very vibrant. They had not yet wilted. Um, and part of me wishes that that could be what I would show you today. But on the other hand, I understand that that's kind of the nature of this project, that it, be, it exists for a time and then it goes away on the one side and then the other side is left. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Um, and would you like to read this? Absolutely. So the project is titled Life After Life. So this might be a little bit reiterative, but <laughs> this mask is inspired by the duality of sustainable creation. Either we attempt to create something from nature that can return to the earth or we re reuse materials that cannot. The right side is temporary, uh, or I, depending on if you're wearing it or looking at it, the right side is temporary, representing life and is made of chia sprouts. The left is permanent, representing the afterlife of its components, which in this case are reused plastic and polyester thread. Gorgeous, thank you so much, Madeline. Thank you. We'll be moving along to Jess. Over here, we'll give the camera time to catch up with us. Sure. <laughs> so, hello, All I'm right. Jessica. Um, I'm also in my final class of my undergrad. Took a while to get here, but uh, <laughs> here we are. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, and so this piece is quite personal. Um, when we started with this project uh, around the same time my mother passed away, so I found myself in my apartment just surrounded by bouquets of flowers. So I asked myself, you know, thinking about these overarching themes of, uh, you know, the ephemeral nature of florals and of life and of motherhood and sort of the parallels with this class and thinking about the ultimate earth mother and how do we honor that? How do we protect that? Um, I created a vessel or uh, an amphora made out of flowers, hence the name of the piece, Amphora. Um, so I have some pressed and dried flowers throughout the piece. I have plastic woven into uh, stems and stems woven into plastic to create a sort of beautifully chaotic piece, which is sort of the situation that we find ourselves in on this planet and at this point in time when it comes to sustainability. So, yeah. Great, thanks. And I know you did a lot of research into different kinds of flowers and materiality with that. Do you want to speak yeah, to it? Yeah, so um, not a ton of research. I sort of worked with the materials I had on hand, um, but I discovered there was some sort of interesting discoveries like the, obviously throughout the process of building this, the flowers were really dried out and they would kind of fall apart, which kind of, I don't know, it was, I, I thought that was kind of beautiful in terms of the process of making it. and I. You know, in, in hindsight, if I were to redo it, I'd do a time lapse of like creating it and see like what would end up discarded on the floor because I had to do a lot of sweeping after this. Um, also, yeah, so I did some 3D printing and uh, wanted to have some sort of like see through component, um, something you can sort of look through. Um, yeah, and this is the end result. <laughs> it's lovely. Thanks, Jess. Thank Would you. you like to read this? Uh, sure. So uh, this piece relates to my mother who passed away midway through the semester. I sought to create a form that honors motherhood and provokes discussion around urgent matters affecting our planet. Using the flowers from my mother's funeral, 3D printed plastic filament and plastic wrap, I sought to explore the tension that exists between organic and non-organic material, now found nearly everywhere, and how the two can co coexist in the form of a vessel. The form here can be attributed to the ultimate mother, Earth, the vessel that holds us and nourishes us without whom there would be no life and whom we must protect in order to sustain life. Thank you so much for sharing. Well done. Priya? Hello. <laughs> Am I right in thinking that's our final presentation? Fantastic. All right. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll speak a bit about it. Um, my name is Bria Lunn. I am a first year uh, design for the theater student. 
Um, much like some of my peers, I was, <laughs> I wanted, I was pulled in many different directions um, in thinking what way to go, whether it be kind of something that is very short lived or something that would be uh, recycled, upcycled with plastic that would last longer, which are both roots within sustainability, as we know. So um, I essentially, I took inspiration from a very special place uh, to myself and my family, um, which we lovingly called the Hobbit Wood. Um, and I love model making, I love miniature making, so I, saw, I said, why not? I'll make a little tiny model. Um, so yeah, I made a, a little model, uh, I grew some grass, um, that was a major part of the project, uh, just waiting on the grass and watering it every day. Um, and I made the base out of um, peat, peat, like peat moss, uh, peat, peat moss, pot. <laughs> um, my dad actually very kindly sent me some moss and uh, little saplings uh, from uh, Nova Scotia, which is where I'm from, which is where this place is from. Um, and they're in the uh, um, model, which I will uh, hopefully continue to grow at home. I'm going to try my best. Um, I also made a little guy up here. Um, <laughs> um, and I sewed him out of cheesecloth and filled him with soil and grass seed. Uh, and I knitted, and kind of a little wink, uh, clearly I went with more of the biodegradable route, um, but as a wink to, you know, how we make our impact, um, sadly, very harshly upon Mother Earth. Um, uh, as a wink to that, I knitted um, <laughs> a little outfit for my guy, a little hat and um, overalls out of, um, this is kind of gross, but used floss. Um, all of my floss uh, that I used over the past couple of months, I <laughs> knitted into, well, I cleaned first, yes, um, but I, I knitted into a little set of overalls and hat as a, a nod to what we unfortunately leave behind. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah. Um, that's yeah. it. And you wanna speak a little bit about your first project that also involved knitting? And I also wanna note, just everybody come up and check the roots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, to it. I wanted to kind of highlight the roots that uh, uh, came along with it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my first project, I uh, the, the fix, I wanted to uh, remake a, a costume, a crocheted costume that I had made, a big uh, Pierrot clown style costume. Um, and it was made, uh, unfortunately, out of um, uh, synthetic thread, uh, synthetic yarn. Uh, I did a whole lot of research on that. Um, and there are a lot of alternatives um, in terms of fibers that you can use. Of course, a lot of them are already um, sustainable in one way, but not in another, right? So it depends on where you source things, and it depends on uh, the dyes that are used, even if it's, you know, wool, but with synthetic dyes and things like this. So I did a whole lot of research on that. Um, and yeah, it's also a wink to my first project, uh, my little, um, my little guy. And I wanted, yeah, I also, all of my material, except for the base, which is the peat moss pot <laughs> material, uh, it was also uh, either borrowed or found or gifted, um, which is also kind of really important to me in terms of like my sustainability and I think probably many others of course is the aspect of community. Um, I, le I lent, leaned, I leaned on a lot of people this semester and I think that is something that's super important to me when I bring sustainability into like my art and my designs. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm going to read this. That's okay. Yeah, go ahead. For folks at home, Briar One, this artwork is in reference to a magical place my family and I fondly call the Hobbit Woods. My inspiration came from sweet memories of napping on a bed of moss in the early afternoon sun to the songs of late summer birds. I used plants and other compostable materials so the piece may return to the earth I so dearly love. Thank you, Bria. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. I'm going to pass it back to Anna. Um, thank you so much for coming. Please feel free to continue to look around and explore these projects. Thank you, class. Whoa, you brought it home. 
drop my... <laughs> um, thank you so much for this semester. Um, and the, uh, I don't know, I'm super impressed. Uh, I'm uh, almost gobsmacked, which is not me usually. Uh, I don't lack words. Uh, I really appreciate how much you came on this journey with me. And, you know, this little, little love fest we've been having for the last 13 weeks and, and your vulnerability through exploration was fantastic. Those of you who are graduating, rock on. Uh, Patrick specifically, yay. Um, and we're gonna be here until noon on the dot and then we will strike. To our guests, thank you so much for coming. This is your time to approach individual um, uh, artistic works, uh, call them whatever you will, and ask the students the questions that you might have. I don't know what's happening on Zoom, Anna. Uh, are there questions in the chat? There are no questions yet. Okay. Um, but I do invite folks to, to jump in and make some comments, make some questions. I'm happy to read them out if you don't want to pop in, in video. So feel free to do that. So, okay. Um, so we'll give the opportunity for the people in person to walk around. And I would suggest to you students, um, I don't know, stand at your stations for a while and then mingle. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Awesome. So folks, we'll keep the Zoom going just for another few minutes in case you want to jump in with any questions or comments. And then I'll come back in to shut it down. Thanks for joining us in this way. Talk soon. Awesome. Thanks, folks, in the Zoom. Uh, your comments have been received. Thanks for supporting everyone in the space and their projects. We appreciate you being here with us. And I think we're, we are going to close up the Zoom now and close up the live stream. So thanks, everybody. Until next time. Bye bye.